Welcome to the Community Builders Forum. This is the monthly webinar series by the Fellowship for Intentional Community, live for members and recorded for the general public. My name is Sky Blue and I'm the Executive Director of the FIC. And this month uh, we have development expert Beth Raps joining us to talk about how to uh, raise money and keep your sanity and stay authentic uh, all at the, the same time. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and let Beth uh, introduce herself a little more and uh, we'll have a presentation and then we'll, we'll dive into to Q and A. So Beth, why don't you tell us all a little bit more about who you are? Yeah, um, so I started out as a grassroots fundraiser and that was in the 80s, I'm 57. Um, and I was just thrown into fundraising. We just had to fundraise as a matter of course and I noticed that I was pretty good at it. I noticed that I was, fun I was fundraising for a couple different things and one of them got much less money than the other one. one the, the one that got a lot less money was uh, some feminist organizing that I was doing. So I thought, oh, well, that's ridiculous. Nobody, we need to find the donors who are interested in women and girls stuff. Again, this is in the 80s. And so I found something called the women's funding movement, which was pretty neat and still exists, of course. Um, and again, just kind of figured, figured out that I was pretty good at it. And so did that, consulted, moved to DC, um, began consulting for larger national organizations, found that everybody was writing grant proposals and knew how to do that. But a lot of people were pretty phobic about asking individuals for money, which I knew from my training, which was still pretty fresh in my mind at that point, was the most successful way to raise money is to ask people for money, not to write a grant proposal. Successful, and we can talk about what successful means and you're all welcome to kind of question me about that. Sky, let me know if I'm talking too fast. Um, yeah, and so then it got to be the thousands, the 2000s, and I kept wondering, why don't I have more money? Why can I raise a lot of money, but I don't have a lot of money? And I, when I do have it, I spend it really fast. Um, and I encountered something called money coaching, which addresses the whole emotional stratum of money. And it suddenly everything made a lot more sense. It just still doesn't make complete sense because money is weird, frankly. Um, and capitalism is weird. And just because I work with money doesn't make me a capitalist. I'm not. But I, it's like I translate. I'm also a translator in French and English, published translator. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is just a system I need to translate myself into and out of. And I can help other people do that. And I think that's a pretty good introduction. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's good. Yeah, I definitely do write grant proposals, but I just don't think they're all that. I think building relationships with people is really where it's at. Maybe for, for full transparency and just for, for a little bit of testimonial too, Beth has, has uh, consulted with the FIC on fundraising um, some over the last couple of years. And I have definitely, True. definitely found your, your support and advice really invaluable. And I think it's, it's been important for the FIC as we've uh, shifted more towards recognizing we are a nonprofit. We do have to raise money in the ways, typical ways that nonprofits do, as opposed to the more almost, you know, uh, exclusively uh, mission related business income that the mm. was relying on, which was great. And, and that has been super important, but now moving more into a field where we're also doing more sort of traditional 501c3 type fundraising and sort of coupling those more um, has been really important. And just the simple, like we figured in part because of, of your advice, Beth, that, oh yeah, we just need to act, start asking. And if we just start asking in a more consistent and systematic way, then lo and behold, more money starts coming. More money comes in and it's not flawless and it, it needs tweaking sometimes, I get you. But yeah, that's, that's true. A lot of times people say we're not, nothing's working. I'm like, well, are you actually asking or do you just expect people to kind of intuit that you need money? Not that that's what FIC was doing, but it is kind of a funny thing because we're all so weird about money. Money is just weird. Yeah. Anyway, please go on. Yeah, well, no, so please go, why don't you run us through okay, some sure. of your kind of basic, basic principles and how yeah. you operate and in the world. So, so part of that introduction was to say where I think the gold is, is in people. Um, and in particular, I think it's in, in well, if you're looking at the advertisement, the, the, lingo, the lingo for this webinar, uh, the first question is, what's a real prospect? And I've been doing some consulting lately with people I don't know well, so lucky for me having new clients, basically. And I realized that they don't know what a, what a real prospect is. They don't know what I mean when I talk about building relationships. They have relationships. They have friends. 
uh, as an organization. They have organizational friends and they have individual friends, but they have no idea what's appropriate in terms of asking those friends to, to give. So one of the first things I wanted to talk about was who are your donors? What's a real prospect? And you really need to have all three of the following things. You need to have your, a donor, a real prospect needs to have the ability to give something and everyone has the ability to give something. And you may think you know what their ability is. There are ways of figuring that out, which I'm happy to talk about in the questions. So that's A, ability. They need to have a belief in your cause or you need to be able to induce them to have a belief in your cause. They may not end up having a belief in your cause, but to be a donor and certainly to be a prospect, they need to actually believe in your cause. And then C, um, oh, that's funny. I wrote commitment. Um, they need to have a commitment. I think before they would have a commitment, I would say they have to have a connection. You need to have a direct connection to them. So Barbara Streisand is a really big progressive funder, donor, but I don't know her. And so it almost doesn't matter um, that, that I know that she has the ability and she might even have the belief in my cause. Um, I have no connection to her. So do you want me to stop there, Sky, for a minute or, or no, just go keep, on? Keep going, keep going, this is great. All right, so, so that's where the relationship, and you may have, so if you know someone, you, you know them, you have the connection, you know they have some amount of money and you already know whether or not they have a belief in your cause. If they don't have a belief in your thing, chances are there's somebody else's donor. And there's no scarcity. There might be a scarcity of our asking, of our putting ourselves on the line and making ourselves somewhat vulnerable. But there's really no scarcity of money and there's no scarcity of donors. Um, so it can be okay to just let them go. Just think there's somebody else's donor, that's okay. But you also have to notice when somebody has belief and connection, you can bet they have some money and it's okay to ask them to support you with money to support your cause. So don't give up on your friends. Like your friends are the first circle. I, talk, I often think in terms of concentric circles, your friends are in that first or maybe second circle and they should definitely be asked. And again, if this is controversial for people, we can talk more about that. Um, this leads us to the second question that I wanted to be sure to handle early on is where's the money? And this is the thesis, hypothesis, belief, fact, that you already know the people you need to know to get started. And so my view is that people need to stop looking out there somewhere, as in like Barbara Streisand, and start asking in a planned way and a pretty bold way. I think for most people, it takes a certain amount of boldness. Ask the people you know for money and maybe the people that they know. And there are specific planful, careful, thoughtful ways to do that with good boundaries that don't drive everybody crazy, that don't abuse relationships. So those kinds of things are where I find the sticking points are. It's not that you don't know people with money. It's not that my clients don't know people with money. It's that they, they, everybody has some money. It's that they may be looking out there for some huge amount of money. And then usually there's a kind of hatred or loathing of wealth or people with money. So that and that's facilitated if we're looking out there somewhere we can sort of dislike those people but our friends and ourselves we should be giving money and it's much harder to dislike the money that comes from there so suddenly some conflicts around money might show up but that doesn't mean that this is not the really solid way to go about things and then another interesting question is who gives the most statistically people with less money give a higher proportion of their income than more people with more money. And that's a really interesting thing. They may not give, the, certainly don't give the largest gifts, right? But they give much more, they're much more, they're gen, more generous than people with more money across the board without any other filters. And then I anticipate that we're gonna get a question like what's the best or the easiest way to raise money? And for some people, the easiest way to raise money is to ask people you don't know for money. That's the least successful way to raise money. So it depends on what you mean by the best way to raise money. The most comfortable might be to be as indirect as possible. The most effective, uh, the single most effective way to raise money 
is to do basically what I'm doing with Sky right now, which is be face to face with him, even better physically face to face. And that is one of the scariest things for a lot of people to do. Um, this would be great. This would be a perfectly fine way to raise money to use. And I actually talked with a developer who's developing an app to do this, uh, to use to raise money. Um, yeah. And it goes down from there. If you use the idea that face to face, because we're mammals, is really the, where we have, we both are the most uncomfortable as the askers. And the donor is potentially the most comfortable because they can sort of get a smell for us, a feel for us. Um, and anything short of that is less successful. That, the average for that is about 50% of the time you get what you ask for. Um, you can see why a direct mail piece, whether it's an email or a hard copy, and lots of people are still using hard copy, is less effective, right? Immediately you can see why. And if you buy a list of unknown people and you send them, like, you know, whoever does, I get letters in the mail from people I don't currently give to, um, that's very ineffective. And, and a high rate of return on that is, I think, 2%. Um, and fundraising events can be very successful or very unsuccessful, depending on how much money they cost you to do um, and how personal you're able to be with people. But again, I, that, that dance that we need to do between maybe be, making ourselves uncomfortable and planning to make ourselves uncomfortable, thinking through what's this event going to look like? What is this ask going to look like? I mean, we're so aversive to discomfort. We're so averse to it, but doing that really helps immeasurably just helps fundraising so much. So I'm going to be quiet. I think that's the end of the kind of basics that I wanted to run through. And I can talk for forever till tonight about fundraising. So just tell me what we should talk about. Mm. Um, okay. Well, people can should feel free to start uh, throwing in questions or, or raise your, your hand or write in the chat if you want to. Uh, be seen and heard uh, in this discussion. Um, maybe while people are, are sort of pondering that, um, I'll throw a couple questions uh, at you. Um, you know, you talk you talked about uh, you know fundraising being a lot about relationships, and 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 maybe you could speak a little bit more about that, especially in the context of the, if you are going after grant money, if you are going after foundations. What I've been told yep. is still is about relationships. Yep, um, and that also. Uh, in the context of, of, you know, people giving, giving money. And I guess I'm thinking more a little bit in the realm of, of if you are trying to cultivate larger donors, that this, I, there's this idea that um, you're not at necessarily, you're not asking them for money, you're, you're giving them an opportunity to express their values. Mm -hmm. And so this stuff around around that and relationship, it seems like again, especially in the realm of like more major donors, there's a high potential for uh, in in inauthenticity uh, mm. to creep into that. Nice. Uh, you uh -huh. know, I'm being in relationship with you, you know, uh, maybe uh, at, at least more so because of the money I think you can donate. Uh, and I maybe wouldn't have as much of a relationship with you if I didn't think you could donate as much money. So again, so how do you make sure that there is still a high level of authenticity and transparency uh, in those those kinds of relationships? Okay, so very first I wanna plug an article that I wrote that I published in the Grassroots Fundraising Journal. And it's, um, I was trying to bridge between a woman named Lynn Twist, her work, which is, uh, her work is kind of the heart of money is her slogan and her book. And she tends to work with extremely wealthy individuals and for very, very good causes, different causes from mine, but very, very good causes. I think she kind of identifies with Mother Teresa, for example, it's just a real interesting woman. And the grassroots fundraising journals, all like scrappy, Hi, Sylvan. I'm just going to wait one second. Um, scrappy leftist readers. That's who the Grassroots Fundraising Journal really appeals to. And I have used them, loved them, been trained by the founder of the Grassroots Fundraising Journal since the 80s. Um, and so there's a sort of an ingrained Marxist hatred of wealth. There just is. And I was trying, but meanwhile, people who don't hate money are raising more money than we are. And as a leftist, I'm like, damn, I want that. And there are plenty of leftist, lefty, wealthy donors. And whatever we think about that, that just is. And I'm, frankly, I'm glad. Um, so this is the context that I wrote that article in. And I was trying to bridge between Lynn 
and her effectiveness. She's a wealthy, wealthy person herself. And what does she have that we don't have? And what she, what I, what it came down to for me, and it's a one page article and it's that you can download it free under published articles on my website, um, is an entitlement that it was fine for her. She felt no qualms about asking. Mm. So that, that's just a framework on what you're talking about. But what you're talking about is, am I going to go cheap for power? Am I going to go cheap for money? And so there's, one strand that also has to be, um, I think, identified in that, and that is how much do I hate money? And how much, as a leftist, do I, as a progressive person? I mean, I know that not everybody in, in uh, FIC, every community necessarily identifies as a progressive community. I understand that. But in the main, we do. And in the main, we have this undercurrent uh, in our culture, right? Americans love money. We're all about money. We're known worldwide for being, cap, you know, like Donald Trump. I used to use Donald Trump as a counterexample, and I don't even do that anymore um, for a lot of reasons. So being inauthentic for money. So our re rebel strand is we hate money. We're, we're the counter to that. And for me, there needs to be an integration if we're going to be uh, financially successful and viable. We have, to, we have to heal that, whatever that is. So first of all, I would ask people to think, well, do I hate money? And um, money coaching can really help with that. And I don't care if you work with me. That's not why I'm saying that. I, for a long time, just did it by myself. There's a book called Money Magic by Deborah L. Price, who's the person who did certify me ultimately in money coaching. And Deborah was a financial advisor and she could not, an investment advisor. She couldn't figure out why people made crappy money decisions when they had good information. And then it was like, oh, duh, it's an emotional situation. Money is so fraught. We get it from our parents. We get it from our culture. And so what she did was create uh, eight archetypes derived from Carl Jung that help us tease apart the different voices in our head around money. And it's such incredible. It's so incredibly sane making. So that's one thing I would ask about authenticity. Mm. And then concomitantly, if we hate money, do we hate people with money? Mm. So am I right? And I remember early in my years organizing the Florida Women's Foundation a large, a wealthy donor who was working for the funding movement called me up and interviewed me. I was just a fledgling. She was interviewing some fledglings and I had gotten some good notice because I'm a good organizer. And she said, wow, you're going to be really good as when you stop hating people with money or when you stop hating money so much. And I was like, what? Me? How can you? I kind of felt like, how could you tell? It was very interesting. She could pick up on it. And I thought, oh, I feel bad because she's a wealthy person. She didn't care was no attachment, no skin off her nose at all. Mm -hmm. So those are, and I speak from experience, those are really important. So if you're going to go, and then you're going to hate yourself, right? Because you're going to go cheap for money. You're going to like somebody more because they have money. You're going to be weird around them. Just do your work. Try to get as clear as you can about money and what its place is in your personal life. Um, I think that goes a million miles to answering your question. Try to be self-observant. I mean, Sky, I know you're a meditator. So I, I know this is falling on fertile ground with you, that you're self-aware. And I don't know how self-aware some listeners are, but I cannot overstate it. I'm a meditator too. It's really, really important, our own stuff. And that's why the fusion of money awareness, inner money awareness and fundraising is, is powerful. And mm -hmm. organizations, not only do we have personal patterns, organizations have patterns mm -hmm. um, of hatred of money or going cheap for money or all sorts of stuff. Sky, help me redirect if I'm yeah, off the yeah. mark here. No, that's great. That's great. I mean, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about this this idea of the the you're not asking them for money. You're giving them an opportunity to. Oh right. No, I'm totally asking them for money. Uh -huh. I don't get to decide what their values are, and it is an absolute. My organization, if I'm raising money for it, is impact is I adore it. I, this is also how I feel about my clients. I hold them in the highest esteem. I hold you all in the highest. Anything I'm going to bother to raise money for, I have to more than give a shit about. I have mm -hmm. to be really, really passionate about. So I have no integrity issues. Um, I, nothing is on the line for me. I would give, I give to my own organization. That's really important that you give. Um, great. Thank you. Um, that's such a nice comment. Um, so I don't get to decide what your values are. And so there's a little bit of that avoidance, that money avoidance thing that I'm giving you an opportunity. Yeah, I'm totally giving you an opportunity. Am I giving the same opportunity to people who can give me $5? Anything that we say about a wealthy person, I want to know if we can say about a poor, someone we identify as poor. Um, what other opportunities am I giving them to show their values? Am I only giving them the opportunity to give me money? Mm -hmm. So 
when I was a young woman, I was 24 maybe, I drove down from Orlando to Miami to raise money from a donor to my women's foundation. And uh, I had permission to meet her in her home. So I had set up the visit um, carefully with a letter and a phone call and an agreement. I drove, I pretty much was going down there to meet with her and a couple of other people. It was a long trip. And she said, sure, come meet me. And I was going to ask her for $500, which was a huge amount of money for me at that time in the 80, it was 84 or something. And um, she said, no, what else can I do for you? Mm. And I thought, oh, well, I'm an organizer. Here's all these other cool things you can do for us. You can organize a chapter in Miami. You can apply to join our board. And that, that was implicit that she couldn't buy her way onto our board, which was very important to me. Mm. My class background is, is want to be middle class, but kind of confused and sometimes not having enough money to really be middle class, but identifying more or less with the middle class. My grandparents were super duper, not always literate, working class immigrant, immigrant folks. Um, and I sort of started telling her some things she could do. I think it was a real, it would be a heartbreaker to me. And even then it was a heartbreaking idea to me that I only saw her as money. Mm. And she, I, you know, she said, thank you. And I drove home and a couple of weeks later, she sent us a check for $20,000. That is a story I tell as often as possible. I don't tell it more than once per encounter, but I am convinced that having seen her as something other than a person with $500 written across her forehead helped her understand where I was coming from. She did end up joining our board. She was a staunch advocate. She was a fabulous board member. And there, I have very high expectations of board members and they all have to give and they all have to raise. And those are two different things and they really vary depending on the income level of the person involved. Um, and there's also fiduciary and legal responsibilities for board members. So that I'm giving you an, an, an opportunity, but what other opportunities besides giving me money am I giving you? That's great. That's great. Okay. Um, jumping back real quick, the, the book Money Magic by, what was the name again? Deborah to... L. Price. Should I put it in the chat? Yeah. Why don't you do that? That would be, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> type it in there. Make sure that in the chat it's, it's going to, um, yep. Uh, you've got it uh, as going to all panelists. Uh, oh, great. Sorry. Yep. All panelists and attendees. Dick, great. Um, well, let, let's uh, let's get to, to Sylvan's question here. Uh, she writes, I've seen house concerts used as fundraising events, small and personal, like you said. Usually the band donates their time as their donation. What's your opinion of the sec success of this? Good ideas to help it go well, success tips, or is it not really a favorite method? Um, well, I would love, I'm kind of outing you, Sylvan, I would love you to talk about how successful it's been for you. Um, I think for me, it's a fine way of raising money. Anything anybody will do for me for free to help me raise money, I'm going to figure out a way to use it. Um, because I pretty much you don't turn away, like it's dumb to turn away love. And that's a way of showing love. And sh showing allyship with whatever the cause is. So let me, instead of outing you, which you're so welcome to um, write in and say how successful it's been for you. Let me tell you a few things that I would do to make it, to ensure that it was as successful as possible. So I would have an MC, um, really one person who cues the audience to know, oh, this is the person who's framing the event. In, from the get-go, the MC conveys the message, one message, this is a fundraiser. Yes, we want you to have a great time. Uh, and this band is being outrageously generous and either they're giving it to us, you know, they're donating their time or they're charging us very, very little. We're so grateful. We've invited you to have a wonderful time. And actually, let me step back. Whenever I do the promotion for the event, I make it really clear that it's a fundraiser. It's not just come have a good time. So this is true whether I'm, if I'm gonna go ask like that donor in her living room, she knew darn well I was coming there to ask her for money, which was what made it such an interesting thing when she said no, right? Mm -hmm. So you never spare people, you never protect them or um, deceive them that you're not going to ask them for money. And so that would be part of the messaging is this is a fundraiser. Bring your checkbook is what I tend to say, or bring your credit card nowadays, we'll have a square We'll have Square, you know, there to take credit card and check donations. Bring cash. Um, all donate unless it's not true. I would all donations are welcome. Donations of every size are welcome, and we really mean that. Like from fifty cents on up. I mean, I don't know, ten cents on up, but you know, 
Um, so that's how I would make sure that I messaged it so that then when I, as an audience member, I get there and there's the MC telling me exactly what I heard in the messaging. There's a consistency and a clarity there that I really like. Um, and now I'm speaking as a consultant that I like that. Um, and so the MC gets up and talks about the organization a little bit, talks about the cause. And then of course we move right into the band and they play, play, play. And, but the MC has kind of told us what to expect and has agreed with the band. All right, how long is the set going to be? Okay, so 45 minutes sounds good. The end of 45 minutes, the MC comes back up, says, wasn't that amazing? Uh, we have snacks and drinks over there. Uh, find me or find these other five people in the audience or come to the back of the room. Let's, so immediately begins to tell me how I can give. Makes it, there, and there, there shouldn't, there's just a few ways that I can give and I can either find a person, you could pass a bucket around, um, if it's a huge audience, I wouldn't pass a bucket. I'd be afraid of somebody taking money out of the bucket. I'm sorry. Um, I'm weird. Um, maybe. Or there's people at the back of the room or wherever people came in to register um, is where I can give money. And so the first message is that at, if it's a two-hour event, that might be the time of the big ask. I want there to be a big ask. That's just a casual, like, here's an orientation. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Here's, you know, go pee there, eat and drink here, give here. We'll be back in 15 minutes with more, with a second set. Depends on, I wouldn't, fundraising events to me probably don't want to be longer than about two, two and a half hours. So roughly at the midpoint or whenever you think there's the most people, I'm drawing that curve, right? The most people are going to be there. And it could be in the middle of a set. The band is awesome if they can say, and now we're going to give the stage to Alice Jones, because Alice, we're here because of this cause and that the band makes it, is it willing to say that they don't have to make the ask, they shouldn't make the ask, but they're willing to say, we transfer our loyalty over to, to this organization. We hope if you loved us that you'll listen to this woman or man or whatever person, other gender person talk about this cause. And it should be crisp, the ask should be crisp, it should be clear, it should be strong. There could be slides could be a PowerPoint. I just saw that done recently. I was consulting to somebody's fundraiser. Um, and there should be an ask. I hope you will give, I would love you, you know, I give regularly to this organization. Tonight, today, I hope you'll give whatever you can, whatever you've considered you can afford to this cause. If it's urgent, I tell them it's urgent. If it's not, it's just, this is a really important thing. We're looking to achieve this result. Please give. And here's where you do it. And you repeat where to give. And then basically the event winds down. There's another set. There might be a closing. If you haven't already given at the very end of the event, if you haven't already given, go to the back of the room. Please, if you have a dollar, we would love it. If you're willing to get, and the other thing is collecting names. If you're willing to give us your name and email address, or if you want a postal address, whatever information you're collecting, please give us, please join our mailing list. We will ask you for money in the future at some point. But more importantly, we want, to, we want you to enroll you. We want to, you to be part of our cause. We want to involve you in what we're doing. There are, and if there are clearly a number of ways that people can be involved, like my story with my, my friend, the wealthy donor board member, tell people what else they can do. If you need an in-kind donation of a big truck and that's more valuable to you than the money, ask for a big truck. Yeah. You never know who knows who in a crowd. So those are my thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's there's a there's something in the feel of what you're saying that it, it's like making sure that the, that people feel held in the experience that mm. they, they both have a clear understanding and clear expectations going in about what what the event is 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 going to be and then at the event there's never a what's going on right now or what am I supposed to they, they, they're just they're held in the structure and the flow of of how the event is being being conducted. I love that. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Because giving money is even weirder than asking for money, mm -hmm. uh, especially giving money like that, where you actually have to think about it. I mean, crowdfunding is sort of easy because you don't, you know, you, nobody sees you doing it unless you declare on social media that you've done it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, being held is really important. We have to remember that as askers, that it's usually weirder for the other person. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one reason we, we role play mm -hmm. and we practice asks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sylvan. That was a nice appreciation. Um, reminder to everyone who's on, you can feel free to ask questions. If you want to engage in conversation, you can. Um, uh, 
another I guess I thought of another question that I can another prompt for you, Beth. Um, I mean, you spoke to this a little bit, but you know, if you if you've got a new client, a new potential client coming to somebody who's who's heard about you, heard about the work you do, it's like, hey, would you would you help us get our fundraising uh, scene more more together? What are the what are the first few questions you're going to ask them about about their situation or their approach or that sort of thing? Sure. Actually, one of the first things I'm probably going to do is ask them to look at their budget. Mm. I might ask to see like the last full year's income with some sources if, and this is implies a certain amount of trust. So it might be that I had first, we'd have some phone call a discussion and I'd love to see their expenses. And I've never had an organization refuse to do that. I think if those are, if you're a nonprofit, that's actually public information. Hmm. I don't know if everybody knows that. So legally I could find that information anyway. Um, I think if someone's not willing to be transparent about that, I would want to probe why. Mm. I have actually encountered organizations doing unethical things with reimbursements and credit cards and like weird stuff. And that uh, I will point out. Um, I will definitely tell a board of directors that they're in a really uh, illegal and bad position because you're putting your board at risk if you do stuff like that. So those are really worst case scenarios. Those are huge red flags. Um, what I look, so those are like at the physical material level, but because I'm raising clarity, I'm allowed to ask, I mean, I've decided that my purview is the world of the emotion of emotions, the unconscious. Um, I'm a very spiritual person. I'm in, I mean, to me, the etheric world is a very tangible place. Um, I actually go there sometimes with clients. It depends on how ready they are for that. And I love working with faith communities, but moving away from the spiritual realm, I'm because money is so loaded psychologically, emotionally, um, I start looking for patterns with people, what they're afraid to do, what they feel can't work. Where, but at the same time, I look at where they've had success. And generally, I'm building on where they've had success and sort of very gently trying to branch that out and make that bigger. Because where you feel success, you feel confident. And when you feel confident, you can branch out a little bit. And a lot of times people are, they're not thinking to ask their existing donors for more money. There's a stagnation. We can only ask them for this. They've been so good to us. There may be a dependency on like one or two large donors, which can be a real mess because people change their minds over some amount of time. Sometimes they will go on and do something else and leave you. Um, that's normal. It's actually normal to lose a third of your donors every year. I don't, people may not realize that. Um, I make sure that I feel really strongly about the end result. Um, if I don't really care about what they're raising money for, I can't work for them, basically. Um, there are tons of great fundraisers. So I've really worked hard to identify what's my brand and who really is right for me to work with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if you could say, talk a little bit about, about uh, there's some some s more structure nuts and bolts sort of, sort of things one of the things that i think Especially. people don't often realize is that you know uh, people people usually use the term nonprofit as shorthand for 501c3s and not mm. uh, many people don't realize that there are actually all sorts of nonprofits that do offer tax exempt status but what they don't do that a 501c3 does is allow people to give tax deductible donations and that that's the particular thing that that you're you're you want with a 501c3 but i, I think what's in, what's interesting is that you know i think a lot of, like you said a lot of people who give don't give a lot and i think especially you know i think in in for the FIC, a lot of people who give and give small amounts, um, they they don't even they don't necessarily even care about the tax deduction. Like this right. is not, so so in some depending on what you're going for, how much is a five hundred one c three even necessary or useful? And then there's also kind of the opportunity the op uh, option of getting fiscal sponsorship from some existing five hundred one c three. You know, any thoughts you have about the that that sort of realm? Sure. I think you've laid out you've laid out the landscape really really well, and I don't even think about nonprofits that aren't. I mean, I, I know that some communities are organized as churches that that, but that's kind of new territory to me, and I know that there can be a nonprofit project of another organization. There's lots of different ways you can structure something. Structuring it should never be an obstacle. 
I do know that there's enough fluidity of structure. Everything seems to me has its downfalls and everything has its benefits. So there's a liability to almost any structure like lobbying. You can actually do a tiny amount of lobbying as a 501c3. Mm. It's very, very small. Um, so I increasingly find that it does tax deduction doesn't matter. I mean, for, if you're a large donor, it really does matter. It makes a material difference. I like, like many people, it doesn't make much of a difference to me at all, personally, given my income. Um, and I do, I'm a pretty simple liver. I tend to prefer to have time over money um, for myself personally. And I think crowdfunding, the whole phenomenon of crowdfunding has shown us that people, that you can crowdfund for all sorts of things that aren't tax deductible. Um, People seem to me when they love something, they want to give money to it. It doesn't seem to matter what it is. We're just habituated that, but you know, nonprofit tax exempt. It's true. It seems to be the easiest, but I think that's because we think it is. Mm -hmm. But it's so true that to so many people, it means really nothing. Mm -hmm. The important thing is to be honest, right? If you aren't, if you can't offer tax deductibility, that you don't say that you can. And then what you're talking about with a fiscal sponsor, a fiscal sponsor is someone who has 501c3 status and lends it to you, basically, sponsors you. And good fiscal sponsors do a bit more than that. They do accounting for you. They might coach you. They take a percentage and you can figure out what that percentage, you, you don't get to necessarily tell them what their percentage is. Usually you don't but there are ones that take more and ones that take less. And I think it's good to pick it, be pretty picky um, and interview. And you would have to do work that is tax exempt. I mean, that type, you couldn't do a ton of lobbying and keep your fiscal sponsorship. It still has to be within the IRS guidelines, mm -hmm. but it, it does mean you don't have to have your own board. It does mean you can wake up one day and if you have a kick-ass idea, you can get fiscal sponsorship and not have to worry about having a board first. Um, those are some, yeah, thoughts about that. Structure is really important. Good record keeping is really important. Having an Excel spreadsheet is not important. I, I for years, organized using a Rolodex, and I, I do my budgets in Word half the time. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. I, I, you know, they're good and they're solid. And now I know how to use Excel. Mm -hmm. I will say that. Um, mm -hmm. Not well. Still not well. Lots of people know how to use it better than I do. So structure and accountability and clarity are very important. And I don't just say that because we're raising clarity, like, because you're messing with, you know, just because money's so important in our culture, laws around money are really important and they're important to respect. It's also important if you do have a board that you not put them at risk. So you, they have to know everything that's going on. And if they don't care, they need to leave the board. They actually, I don't like rubber stamp boards where they just all say, yeah, 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 to whatever the founder's doing. Conversely, you can also, I recommend that you get directors and officers insurance, which protects board members like uh, personal assets. Because if I'm on your board and you screw up, my personal assets can be seized and used to pay off whatever debt you've incurred. And mm. I, I would never be on a board nowadays, even with as comparatively little money as I have without directors and officers insurance. And it's not hideously expensive. Mm. That's a beginning attempt at addressing I mean, if there's specifics, I love budgets. I love numbers. I love messing around with, you know, looking at money and how to use it. But those are what I think about off the top. Great, great. Um, you're, I'm not sure how you refer to your, your company, your organization, Raising Clarity. Whatever. Yeah, it's really just a doing business as. It's just me, but it's kind of a brand. And I right. work with, like, my non-visible guides. And so I don't just think of it as me. Right, right. Yeah. Well, so mm -hmm. the so the name raising clarity. I mean, it's it, it seems like there's you know it's a it's a little bit of a play on raising money, but it's right. raising clarity. So, uh, so what is, say more about what that means? What does it mean to be raising clarity as opposed to raising money? As opposed to raising money, and it's not opposed to raising money. It's I think I and I've really come into understanding it. I didn't make up that name. I hired a branding specialist, and he interviewed a bunch of my clients. And I know there's a ton of good fundraisers out there. And he said, well, what people really get from you is clarity, mm -hmm. um, like laser clarity. I'm very honest. I can be painfully honest. Um, and I trust my intuition. So I usually think I'm right, even if people tell me I'm wrong. I just had a potential client say, you really offended us when you took, you said you were taking a risk and you I had a Zoom interview and you said something that is wrong. It's just totally wrong. And I'm like, 
I don't want to work with you because I sincerely believe that I was right about that thing that I was picking up on and you aren't willing to question whether I'm right or not. Mm -hmm. So kind of, I trust my intuition and I also trust my detachment and I try to teach those, both of those things so that I am, when I leave someone, I try to work myself out of a job as quickly as possible. I am teaching them my budgeting skills. I'm teaching them how to ask, but I'm also teaching them to start to recognize their own patterns around money. And so clarity means, doesn't mean you suddenly are like whitewashed. It means you know your own yourself. You know your own patterns around money. You have some detachment. When you can see things, you can detach a little bit from them. And you also trust your intuition. People, not everybody I work with has any spiritual life at all. Most people have some idea about meditation and that there's a chattering monkey mind and that maybe the heart is a good place to work from and that the heart can be a good advisor, especially because to me, the guarantor of authenticity and integrity in this field is love. And yeah, when you're working from, hopefully you love what you're doing. Hopefully you love your cause. Um, I'm thinking even if it's a negative, terrible thing that you're trying to redress, right? Like climate change. I've worked a lot in climate change. It's not pretty. And yet getting people to wake up to it is a beautiful thing. Helping people see that there are things we can do not to suddenly turn the emissions, you know, that's like a hundred year signal. Never mind. I shouldn't get started. But there are things there are ways we can adapt. Hmm. Those are beautiful things. I do that work out of love, right? That's really important. So helping people assess where's the role of love in all of this. It's got a huge role. It just doesn't mean that because you love you should lie about your books. Like that's or you should pretend anything or you should love your board so much that you can't let them go when they suck. Like you can love them and say, okay, clarity demands that I ask you to leave the board and I love you, but you're not, you're not doing the work of a board, for example, mm -hmm. or that a donor wants to give you a huge amount of money, whatever a huge amount of money is for you. And you, you love your cause. So you take the money, even though you don't agree with what they're asking you to do. Misuse of love, right? Love and clarity, wisdom and compassion. We could talk about that from the Buddhist standpoint. Right, right. One, one, one question that's occurring to me is, is, so in the, in the range of intentional communities, there's, you know, there's the communities that, that do have, you know, that are more mission driven, that have some kind of, of uh, outward facing mission, maybe it's an outreach sort of thing, education sort of thing, you know, whatever it is, um, sort of more built in and, uh, and others that are more just going for basically comfortable places for their for their members to live and mm, you know yeah. I, especially in the in the startup of of a, of a new community uh, obviously the financing of a project is always an issue and in, increasingly there are not people who have the same kind of access to resources that have allowed many of the the you know existing long-standing communities um uh you know i mean i think i think way back at in the day when when the founders of Twin Oaks 50 years ago when they got started you know they the the eight of them or so that started the community basically just worked jobs for a while until they had enough money to buy a piece of land and I, I feel like you know that is that is decreasingly viable as, as an option in the world today as and and increasingly you, you people have to get more creative about where they are finding money and often that involves raising money now it's always been my sort of assumption that the more mission driven you are probably the easier time you're going to have finding funding finding finding financing for your community but i wonder how if whether that's true like even you know, in terms of raising money for a project, even if it's like, you know, we want to create a just, you know, we just want to create a good place for our, our people to live. Um, you know, is that, a, is that viable from a fundraising perspective or is being more mission driven important? I would never want someone to be mission driven if they didn't really believe in the mission. Sure, like sure. to raise money for a mission when really all you want to do is just create a better way of living for your community members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That to me is a smacks of a kind of scarcity idea that people won't give to us if all we're trying to do is create a good way to live for our people, mm -hmm. um, I'm bold enough to feel that strangers could be brought to care about a community where they don't live. And certainly kind of people in the middle, 
can be brought to care about a community. And what I mean by in the middle is someone who doesn't live with you in your community, but isn't a complete stranger to intentional communities or things like them, worker co-ops, any kind of collective, um, credit unions, unions, people. So anyone who understands solidarity in any way um, can be asked for funding. Typically, I would give more the more directly I'm involved in something, um, which means you should ask your core. I don't care who they are and I don't care what their cash income is. Um, they should be giving, I think. And they should certainly be asked. But if you're thoughtful about who this sort of second tier of people is, it seems to me that you could construct an, an argument. You could make a case to them. I want to know that other people are living well. And I give to other people living well. I'm, I want to go ahead and read. Uh, Sylvan has just contributed that many intentional communities have, quote, associate programs for non-residents, which almost always have an annual fee and confer some benefits. That makes total sense to me. Right. Yeah. So that's how I would begin to think about that. And then I would call into play the traditional, the ways that I've talked about raising money and mm -hmm. some of the ways we haven't talked about yet. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it seems like there's still something there around, even if, even if your, your goal as a community is, is to create a, a good life for the people who, who live there, there's still something about you're, you're, you're still going to have connections with people outside of the members of that community. And so there's still a sense of kind of building the sense of community beyond the, the property line. Um, right. The wider community, your allies, mm -hmm. or your allies, what do they, what do they get? I mean, they may just get the idea that they're contributing to something wonderful that they don't participate in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know as much about the associate membership that Sylvan has commented on. I think it's a really interesting concept. That's a way of formalizing it. Yeah. I think if I stuck my toe in the water and I tried it once and I got a decent result, I might create an associate membership. And there's a kind of self-esteem that is implied in that, that we think what we're doing is so cool. The people who don't even live here might care about it. Like for a number of reasons, maybe we're raising something unusual. Maybe we're just old, like Twin Oaks, like maybe we're venerable and we represent hope and we represent legacy. We represent permanence in this alternative way of living. That's increasingly so important, right? Um, boy, I've just been traveling and noticing a ton of homeless people and think, and there are people I was in uh, Mountain View, California, near Palo Alto. There are people sleeping in trailers who work for Google. Mm. They can't afford the rent. They're sleeping in these small mobile homes around a square, and the city is going to start offering them pumping out services. Uh -huh. And these are way like middle income people, like something. I mean, our system is so broken, right? M my partner and I, M Michael and I, met at the annual conference at Twin Oaks, the communities conference. To us, it's like really obvious that community makes sense. Intentional community makes financial sense. I don't want people doing it for that reason, but if I'm a well-to-do person or if I'm just making it okay in the world, I like knowing that there are viable alternatives that other people have um, besides homelessness and sleeping in a trailer. It's just, it's just so wrong. So to me, you are, if you're doing that, you're creating a community, you're, you're giving the world another option that's pretty important right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I could see, quote, selling that, which is not, there's nothing, I don't mean that in a gross way. I know people hear that in a gross way, and I'm kind of pushing into that, that edge of, e. um, you could ask people if they'd like to support that. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense to me. Well, I'll put it, I'm going to put another call out to our participants. Yeah. Questions. You guys, if you don't have questions, we're going to wrap up early. No yeah. question is too small or too big, as you can see. We have fun. I wonder if I wonder if there's anything more you want to say about about the spiritual side of of, of your work, because I know that is that is such an important bit. Uh, it's, it's so fundamental for you. But is there anything you haven't haven't already touched on that you'd like to say more about? I think about? no, because it, that would really be community dependent, and I mean community in the loose sense. Mm -hmm. Like if I have permission, if I'm working with a Christian community or Hindu community, I'm going to work. I know I'm sort of polyvalent when it comes to spiritual practice. I would 
be using archetypes, for example, but you don't have to have a spiritual life to believe that an archetype has some power. Women who run with the wolves. I'm reading a book by Jean Shinoda Bolin about crossing to Avalon. Um, Robert Bly's work with Iron John, mm -hmm. all kinds of wonderful archetypal stuff. You don't have, that can just be psychological. I think um, basic clarity of mind, you know, it sounds like that's real estate that's owned by the Buddhists. Lots of people do that stuff. Lots of people understand that observing your own mind is important. I think that's probably all I, I would go into with an audience where I have no idea what people believe. And the last thing I want is for people to tune out anything and not get use from some nugget that I might offer. Mm -hmm. I will say that I think having a spiritual perspective helps you take the long view. It helps me not burn out. It helps me personally not be skeptical or cynical. If I sound like I am to me, I'm just being realistic. Um, I, I believe in the beloved community. Well, you don't have to be a spiritual person to believe in. Dr. King is the one who made that phrase famous. Um, it's actually was coined long before King. King encountered it, we think, in, the in theological school. It was coined by Josiah Royce, who talked about what it means. Because I was like, okay, I'm an organizer. How do I organize the beloved community? Um, and so I did some research into what it was, what it is underpinning, what the underpinnings of it are. Mm -hmm. um, King talked a lot about it and I wanted more, even more detail. So I think those things really help when the short term looks really painful or difficult as it does for us all at all, you know, at any given moment. Mm -hmm. I think that's enough about, about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no other questions have come in. So I think, I think we can move towards wrapping up here. Um, are, are any, any, any other parting thoughts, any, any conclusion summary type things you want to, you want to offer before we? I think the kinds of things that we've been talking about now toward the end, the beloved community and the importance of intentional communities. I mean, I really want to speak to the audience here that you, you listening at whatever point you're listening to this recorded or live, may not realize what a miraculous thing that you're doing hmm. you just might not quite i mean sky is a, you're a great example of that and i don't want to make you blush but just and you have some sense of that i think because you you you're out in the world and you bump you bump into all sorts of other communities um the importance of what fic is offering for example as an example uh the support systems infrastructure resources that it offers incredible and the generosity of it basically a lot of it being for free I'm constantly referring people to the website saying, you should take a look at this. Um, and I know my little fledgling community, we have a link, you know, there, uh, Donald's view, by the way. Um, just, I wonder if people realize the miraculousness and sometimes just sitting and allowing that and, you know, maybe in private so you can have a good cry because it's just so much work and it's so amazing. But if you look at the rest of the world, you realize how amazing it is. Mm. That kind of, Deep, deep, deep sitting and understanding and really steeping yourself in the amazingness of your own work, the miraculousness of your own work, gives you the calm, quiet confidence to then say, oh, of course, I would like to tell you about my community and I'd love you to give us a gift of, you know, if you know an amount that makes sense for that person, great, ask for that. And I'd love you to just make a gift or become an annual member. Let me tell you about what we're doing and just find, find the amazing stories. It helps you see your own amazing stories. Those are really important. Mm -hmm. one, one little anecdote I feel inspired to, to share from um, FIC's work, uh, you know, developing our fundraising and, and, and again, part, you know, the, the um, support that we've gotten from you was I remember about three years ago was when we started having a more of a conversation with the board around the need for the board to be engaged in, in fundraising. And I remember one of the people who was sort of most reticent uncomfortable at the time was Harvey who uh, who is you know has been involved since the beginning um, you know and and just you know knows a million people in in the movement and is just one of the most you know good-natured kind-hearted thoughtful intelligent um, people I've ever I've ever met and uh, you know so but he had some you know so he was like I, well, I don't really know people with money and blah blah and then and then after, as time went on at some point you know working with you and just so it's like, okay, extracted data about Pat, you know, people with donor donating history and kind of organized that in a way that was a little more digestible so that board members could go through and look at it. And, you know, Harvey then looks at it and is like, oh, I know 
90% of the people on this, I can give these people a call, you know, and then a couple of years ago when we were doing this big push, he, he made, I think it was like over a hundred phone calls over the, over the course of a month or two. Um, but in part, it was like, he realized, oh, these are people that I know. And even if they give $20, like that's great. And it was, it was huge. It was huge. And it was such an interesting transformation for him and his perspective mm -hmm. around it and what he was able to, to, you know, how he was able to, to support the organization in this, this new way that he hadn't conceived of before. So yeah, it was really, really great. Yeah, powerful. And story. in some ways that he had been doing before, but he hadn't appreciated the cumulative effect of what he right. had done. And no. he certainly hadn't identified as a fundraiser and maybe he never will. But to me, that's like, oh, re realizing I raise money. One, right, of the, right. one of the weird things I do is, oh my God, I raise money. That's crazy, but it's true. Right, yeah, right. And, and, and he just, does that on the strength of his relationships. Right, right. He 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 had spent the last thirty years building the beloved community, and then he realized that oh, he could just he could ask that community for money, and they would they would respond. 